Well, how many of you ha- are familiar with or at least have heard the term Missio Dei? M I S S I O D E I. I know some of, some of us have. If you've seen it and you're wondering where you've seen it, you've probably seen a church. It's a very common way that term is used. And if you didn't guess, it's a Latin term um, that uh, means mission of God. And uh, although it sounds like a term that is centuries old, which I guess in a sense it is because it's Latin, um, our understanding and use is actually fairly recent in, in church history. Uh, it was coined by a German missiologist uh, by the name of Karl Hartenstein or Hartenstein in 1934, so 90 years ago. Uh, this really came into popular usage in the church. And if you're wondering what a missiologist is and what they do, they basically study missiology in terms of the church uh, from a historical perspective, from a biblical perspective, and they, are, they have become very valuable assets uh, in the church in helping us understand not only what our mission is as the people of God, but also understanding and, and developing methods and ways that we can be faithful to that mission while at the same time taking the gospel into places as, as the church has expanded in various cultures and, and around the world and, and throughout the ages, ways that are not only biblically faithful but effective for that, that time and place in that culture. And so uh, that was, it's something that the missiologists really started working there in the early part of the 20th century. Um, <clears throat> but it has, uh, it's become a very popular term, at least among church leaders, uh, especially over the last 30 or 40 years. And that idea or concept of Missio Dei, the mission of God, is, is our way of, one of our ways of, of understanding and articulating this idea and, and truth that God is a, the God that we worship, the God of the Old and New Testaments, is a sending God. He is a missionary God. It's not just that He has a mission, but He sends on that mission as well. And even though you won't find that terminology necessarily specifically in Scripture, it is one of the most important concepts and, and truths that's communicated there. And there have been all sorts of ways that we have built frameworks to kind of understand and walk through that. One of the most helpful ones that I've seen, um, and if I knew who to give credit to, I would do that, Uh, but one of the most helpful ones that I've seen for me is is to understand it this way, that, that God, the mission of God is that He sends. Now, if you want to have an idea of what that mission looks like, you look at Jesus. Jesus is the embodiment of that mission. Uh, both in its purpose and in its, its possibility. The Holy Spirit is the power for that mission. So the indwelling presence of the one who's made it possible and who showed us what it looks like is the power for that mission. The church, if you hadn't guessed already, is the instrument for that mission. We are the ones that God has sent out and has called to live that out. And the world is in, in all of its contexts and places and cultures, that's the environment, that's the place in which that mission is carried out. Um, <clears throat> and one of the tasks of the church in, in any age or place it finds itself is to rediscover or realize that that's a reality, that that's the mission of God, and to, and to claim that and understand what that looks like as its fundamental identity. Simply put, God is a missionary God. And the normal posture of the church in every age and culture in which it finds itself should be that on mission, namely, specifically, the the mission that God has. Um, It was one of the, the final things that Jesus passed on to his disciples. As the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. In the Gospel of John, in Matthew, he gives the Great Commission. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me, therefore go, which is another way of sending, you know, you say go, um, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son. Uh, Jesus told his disciples very early on in Acts in a verse I think that we have referenced every week in this series so far, that they would be his witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. In Acts 8, which is where we are at this point in our series, 
that's where we really start to see this mission come into reality. Uh, from here on out, the story of the book of Acts is how this message of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection, which is the, really the content of our mission, that's what we take, is the good news of Jesus, how it goes from this small, and I say small, it's, probably, it's over 10,000 now. You imagine our church being a small church of 10,000. Um, this group of people in Jerusalem into the rest of Judea and then ultimately all around the Roman Empire and to the rest of the world. How does that happen? Well, Acts 8 is where that begins, where that story really begins. Because up until now, even though the church is continuing to grow, it's really all around the world. That's where they have been uh, by this point. And Jerusalem was good. Jerusalem was obviously a very important city in the history of the people of God, still is a very important city. Uh, but in order to fulfill the mission, the gospel had to go out beyond the borders and beyond the walls of Jerusalem. For whatever reason, the people had not done that. The church had not, had, hadn't gone, for, left for the rest of Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And I can sympathize with that <clears throat> because that means leaving what's familiar to you. Jerusalem was home. I mean, it, it, was, it was comfortable and it's hard to leave home and, and take that next right step. And in the case of Samaria, into a place that you would even consider to be enemy territory. You're probably not going to find a whole lot of sympathy, at least not at first. You're probably going to run into some weird stuff, which we see the Christians do here on out through the book of Acts. That, that's, in, that's, that's the story that we're going to be in for the rest of our journey through the book. <clears throat> and last week we looked at Stephen. Catalyst, his, his uh, martyrdom and death was kind of the catalyst of what we see happen uh, here at the beginning of chapter 8. The next two weeks we're going to look at another figure uh, who's connected with him, and that's Philip, who were two of the seven that we talked about that had been chosen back in chapter 6 uh, to oversee the food distribution. The first story we're going to look at comes from Acts 8, verses 1 through 25, and then we'll finish up in 26 through 40 next week as we look at, uh, at a place that, that Philip had been called to. But this is what we read uh, in the second half of verse 1 of chapter 8. On that day, a great persecution in Jerusalem, and all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him. But Saul began to destroy the church, going from house to house. He dragged off both men and women putting to, and put them in prison. Those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. Philip went down to a city in Samaria and proclaimed the Messiah there. When, crowd, when the crowds heard Philip and saw the signs he performed, they all paid close attention to what he said. For with shrieks... Impure spirits came out of many, and many who were paralyzed or lay healed, so there was great joy in that city. Now for some time a man named Simon had practiced sorcery in the city and amazed all the people of Samaria. He boasted that he was someone great, and all the people, both high and low, high and low gave him their attention and exclaimed, This man is rightly called the great power of God. They followed him because They believed Philip in the name of Jesus Christ. They were baptized, both men and women. Simon himself believed and was baptized, and he followed Philip everywhere by the great signs and miracles he saw. And when the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had accepted the word of God, they sent Peter and John to Samaria. They prayed for the new believers that there might be that they might receive the Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit had not yet come on any of them. They had simply been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then Peter and John placed their hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. When Simon saw that the Spirit was given at the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money and said, Give me also this ability, so that everyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. Peter answered, May your money perish with you, but you thought you could buy 
You have no part or share in this ministry because your heart is not right before God. Repent of this wickedness and pray to the Lord in the hope that he may forgive you for having such a thought in your heart. For I see that you are full of bitterness and captive to sin. Simon answered, Pray to the Lord for me so that nothing you have said may happen to me. After they had further proclaimed the word of the Lord and testified about Jesus, Peter returned to Jerusalem and many Samaritan villages. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Well, this passage gives us a, a, a really good portrait and picture of what the church looks like on mission, albeit it didn't, it didn't come necessarily the way that they would have designed. Um, it does, they, they do end up doing what God and Jesus had called them to do. And we notice three things here. The first, and this is one of those things, as I said, we can kind of sympathize with, is that the church on mission often begins reluctantly. We don't know how long they had been in Jerusalem, but we do know they had not left quite yet. Um, Acts 8.1 says, on that day when Stephen died, a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem, and all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. The two places specifically Jesus had mentioned that they would be going. And this persecution was bad news. It had already cost one person his life. And Luke tells us that it went from what appears to be just kind of a sporadic persecution like we talked about to being a systematic program to at the very least harass and oppress the church with Saul at the helm. It became so intense that people decided that it was safer to leave Jerusalem, and so that's what they begin to do. And they go into Judea, which is really the rest of the the area, and into Samaria. But there's a bright side to this because it doesn't just tell us that they fleed or fled. I have a grammatical ruling on how I use that. They fled Jerusalem. They took something with them when they went. Verse 4 tells us, that those who were scattered took the gospel with them. Whether they intentionally saw this in this this way, they, they found this to be an opportunity for the good news of Jesus to just go beyond Jerusalem. And so that's what they do, which is exactly how God tends to work sometimes. He can take even the worst circumstances and use them to advance His purposes. We talk about this often. He takes something bad and even deadly, in the case of Stephen, and he uses it to help the church take the most significant step it had taken yet in its mission. They go to Judea and Samaria, and I don't want us to miss how big of a step this was for them. Not just Judea, leaving home and going into the rest of the land, but specifically into Samaria. Um, The Samaritans were a group of people that the Jews hated, and the Samaritans returned the favor. Uh, Jews referred to Samaritans as dogs. What they felt that way about them was they were considered to be half-breed Jews. Uh, that's, that's That's the easiest way to understand that. They didn't quite fit as Gentiles, they didn't quite fit as Jews, and so they were just this group of people, and there was a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, dissension between them. And it wouldn't have been surprising to me, especially as, as people began to learn that Jesus was planning on eventually sending people into Judea and Samaria, that there would have been a little bit of hesitation on the part of, of those in Jerusalem about taking the gospel to those people. We're sometimes reluctant to move out on mission just like the, the early church was, especially when that, call, when that mission calls us to people who are not just different than we are, who don't sound or look or, or act like us, but to people who we might even consider, whether we would use this term or not, deep down our enemies. That was the Jews and Samaritans. 
the good news here out of this story is that we see that God can even overcome those, <laughs> even, even the most severe disagreements and separations between people, which is exactly what we did, what we see here. When we are reluctant by His grace, God sometimes will disrupt our lives and push us out. And when he does that, as we see him do in the case of the early church, he can take care of all of the barriers and things that we may have ourselves. Disruptions might just be God's way of saying, hey, it's time to go. A lot of times we just need a push and God will graciously give that to us. Hopefully that push doesn't come in the form that we chapter 7 and first part of chapter 8. But just as individuals on mission can be reluctant, the church on mission can often begin reluctantly. And that's what we see here. They're, they don't seem to be real quick to go about carrying out this mission that Jesus has for them, and so God gives them a nudge, or he at least uses something that's happened to give them a nudge. The second thing we see here is that the church on mission sometimes encounters surprising successes. They begin reluctantly, probably for a number of reasons. One, I would imagine, would be the people that they're called to, um, <clears throat> but also because there might have been some cynicism about the amount of success they were going to find. Uh, they don't go to Samaria on purpose. But they, they end up being obedient. They end up going. And as they go, we've already said, they take the gospel with them. And what else goes with them, I guess, or who else better goes with them is the Spirit. And perhaps to their surprise, as the gospel goes with them and as the Spirit goes with them, they start to see God move and transform lives. Included in this group that went or that, uh, that was sent out was Philip. Reaches the gospel where he was able to do God miracles and, and, and miraculous signs. He casts out demons, he heals people, and everybody has a and lives are changed in supernatural ways. And as a result, there is joy that comes to the city. There's joy that comes to these villages. I love how, how Luke says it in verse 8, so there was great joy in that city, which tells us that the spread of the gospel is the spread of joy. The same message that changed lives then is the same message that changed lives now, changes lives now. And the same joy that it produced back then is the same joy that we can see and experience it produced today. The same Holy Spirit who is at work in the city of Samaria is the same Holy Spirit that's at work in Canton, Illinois. And the gospel, and as the gospel is lived and proclaimed, we should expect the same things to happen that happened in Samaria, that lives would be transformed. The gospel always does something. It always uh, brings a reaction. In this case, in Samaria, it brought transformation. Sometimes it hardens hearts. Sometimes it hardens, But it always does something. And that's what we see God doing here um, with the gospel. Thankfully, how he uses it in Samaria is, <laughs> is surprisingly successful. In verses 9 through 13, we read a one such success story, or at least on the surface, and at the beginning, this prominent sorcerer by the name of Simon. <clears throat> and I like how verse 13 reads in the English Standard Version, even Simon himself believed. Have you ever seen, uh, been in a situation like that where, where you, you see somebody who is just seems to be completely unlikely to be one who would be transformed by the gospel and that even that person the faith of Jesus even Simon believed 
we're going to have another even when, when, when Saul is converted. Even Paul ends up believing in the gospel. And that apparently surprised Luke, at least in this case, because he says even Simon believed. And here's the amazing thing. <clears throat> another way that we can see the mission kind of spreading out and, and moving out is that the person that God used in it was not an apostle. We've already talked about how God used Stephen, and now God is using who were doing most of the ministry, most of the conversions were coming in in their ministry. So God is not just moving the mission out geographically, He's also spreading it out among the people and using, and using new people that have been raised up. Philip is another one of these seven guys who was picked to distribute food. And here he is converting sorcerers. And not just any sorcerer, a sorcerer that people refer to as the great power of God. So there was something special in the eyes of the people about Simon. <clears throat> and as a result, God uses Philip in his ministry to reach an entirely new people group. Once again, God shows his power and lives are transformed. The apostles get wind of this, and their response could be suspicion or even jealousy. Oh yeah, this guy, this guy Simon, he's not only a Samaritan, he's also a sorcerer. We've got to see this for ourselves. And it but that doesn't seem to be the way that they react. They find out and they, they send John, Peter and John uh, to Samaria, to these villages, to, to not find out. Just as they laid their hands on those seven who were chosen as kind of their blessing on their, their calling, here they are, Peter and John, coming into these Samaritan villages, kind of celebrating with the people what God is doing. And they pray that these new Samaritan believers would receive the Holy Spirit, and they do. The same Holy Spirit that they received back on the day of Pentecost has fallen on these new believers. <clears throat> and I don't know if the, if, if the apostles or anybody else was surprised about all of this happening, but I'm sure there were some in the church who were shocked uh, probably good shocked and bad shocked. Uh, good shocked, just again, celebrating what God is doing, uh, but also bad shocked. You know, you can't please everyone. And I'm sure that there were some who were like, really? Samaritans? So we got to make room for these people now, too. Now, not only do we have to open up for the Greeks, now we have to open up for the Greeks. <clears throat> but that's exactly what we see happening. And I wonder if this, you know, we read these stories and, and again, a sense that it kind of really surprise us that God does things like that. I mean, what if we really believed that the gospel was powerful enough to, to transform lives? What if we believed, like Philip, even though he's one of these seven selected, He's not one of the twelve. What if we believe that we don't have to be somebody special to take the gospel to, to new areas, to new people? And what if we believed, it, it just were crazy enough to believe that God was powerful enough to change lives? Just because that's what God does when they encounter the good news of Jesus Christ. What, what would that look like if we really just believed that? That's exactly what we see in this passage. That's what we see the mission of God doing. Considered to be insane. <laughs> There's this huge revival uh, happening in Samaria, and Philip goes out on this desert road to find this one guy riding out along in a in a chariot. That's where you went. When was the last time we were really surprised by God just because we were crazy enough to believe that this stuff really changes lives and we took the gospel to the least likely people because we were just, we just 
were crazy enough to believe that it might have an impact on their lives. And if we haven't for a while, how long until we do it again? There's one more lesson we learn here. <clears throat> the church on mission often begins reluctantly, but then can meet with surprising results. And then third, the church on mission is messy. That might be one of the most frightening things about being out on mission. The mess that success in that He's all in. Luke says he followed Philip wherever he went, almost to the point where it was probably annoying to Philip. He couldn't believe the things he saw. He might have if that's possible, taking it all in. And it isn't long before we encounter a problem with him. He sees all of this miraculous stuff happening, especially as Peter and John come, and he sees that people receive the Holy Spirit when they pray for them, and he thinks he can capitalize on that somehow and buy that power, almost like he wants to just replace the pagan power that he has exercised with some new kind of spiritual power, with the power of the Spirit. And he offers money to the apostles to buy that power that they have to lay hands on people and give them the Holy Spirit. And Peter's response is, for lack of a better word, quick and strong. Verses 20 through 23, this is what, this is what Peter says. He says, May your money perish with you because you thought you could buy the gift of God with money. You have no part or share in this ministry because your heart is not right before God. Repent of this wickedness and pray to the Lord in the hope that He might forgive you for having such a thought in your heart. For I see that you are full of bitterness and captive to sin. Now, us looking at this on the surface, it seems like it, you know, like, come on, Peter, this was just a bit, this was a bit of a, it's probably a misunderstanding, right? Well, why, why was this such a, a, a serious issue? One commentator says this, the attempt to buy and sell the gift of conveying the Holy Spirit of God amounts to an attempt to manipulate God Himself, which is not only impossible, but a most serious sin. God's good gifts can only be received with thankful hearts, not bought and sold and used for one's own purposes. That's exactly what we see Simon trying to do here. Whether or not he understands it or, 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 or whatever the case, we do see him really overstepping his bounds and, and trying to manipulate God for his own purposes. And so Peter rebukes him. If there was a stronger word for, re, for that, what Peter did right there, I would use it, but he rebukes him. He knows that Simon is still trying to think with a pagan mind and see with pagan eyes. If he didn't allow the gospel to completely transform his thinking and perspective, he was headed for a bitter end. And so Peter does call him and offers him this path to changing his ways. He calls him to repent of this wickedness and turn to God for forgiveness. Peter's words in verse 20 could literally be interpreted, <laughs> as he starts this, to hell with you and your money. You need, to, you need to really consider what it is that you're, you're trying to do and repent so that you might experience the forgiveness of God. He didn't mince any words here in his reaction. This was a messy situation. Was Simon's original belief in the gospel genuine? Was his repentance genuine? Well, I, we really don't know. But it's quite possible that it wasn't. If you look back in verses 9 through 11, Luke gives us a picture of Simon that shows that he had been a, a man of great influence and power in Samaria. As I said, the people called him the great power of God. And now Luke gives us the impression that Simon still thinks he's got some of that and he can leverage that influence to acquire even more power. And Peter sees right through this and calls him out on it. 
And while his response to Simon might seem harsh, there was a lot of grace there. Because Peter could have just condemned him to die and go the way he was headed. Instead, he offers this gracious warning to Simon of where he was headed. But instead of praying for forgiveness, at least not in the way that, that Peter urges him to do, he asked Peter to pray for him. What really seems to concern him is not the true forgiveness and grace of God. He just wants to do enough to escape anything bad. He doesn't show a real understanding of where the deeper spiritual issue lies in his life. Sadly, this is the end of the story that we hear of Simon in Scripture. Church tradition, though, tells us that Simon went on to become a heretic. In fact, there was, in, in one of the most vocal opponents, at least pagan vocal opponents of the church, there's a practice in the, in the, that the church regarded as sin that arose um, that bore his name, simony. It was the practice of the buying or selling of a church office or ecclesiastical preferment. That's not necessarily the legacy we want to leave behind, is to have a, an official sin by the, from the church named after us. But that's sadly the story of Simon. Simon's story could have ended much differently, but sadly it didn't. So while the church can experience some surprising successes, out of those successes can come some messy situations. And so it teaches us that as we take the gospel to people, we are likely going to encounter some messy things. Sometimes people who seem to make a great start just will not allow God to break them from their past sins or their way of thinking. And so the mission can be both wonderful and messy. And I don't know that you could say it can be. It usually is both wonderful and messy. And I love that. I love that God invites all of us to join him in this mission. And I love that it doesn't always go the way we think it should. I also love that we can trust God to take care of that, and he's the one, and he's, we're just, we are just the ones he sends out. We move in. But I love that, that God wants us as his church. He wants you to, to join him on his mission. Sometimes we might feel reluctant, but as we've seen, God can overcome that. Pray that he does. Pray that the way that he overcomes it might not be as severe as the way he overcomes it in Acts. And then as we start to live on that mission... We shouldn't be surprised when people start responding, both in good ways and, and sometimes negative ways. We should celebrate when the gospel transforms lives, and we should expect to see a lot of messy situations. I know that in any one of our lives, we have messy situations that we just deal with, that we, have to, that we have to navigate and encounter. It's no different in the church because the same people who make up those messy situations make up, <laughs> largely make up the church. It's not easy. It's not clean. But I can't think of a better way to live than to live on mission. That's what God calls us to do morning is that if we're reluctant to step out, if you feel that God has been leading you in a direction that might be into that, I think he, he's gracious. He sympathizes with your reluctance. Pray that we celebrate and that we would, we would even if we're surprised and don't expect them to be coming, pray that we would celebrate the successes that, that God brings as we live on mission. And then just pray for the grace and the wisdom to know how to navigate the messiness that's going to come from that. Would you pray with me?